Um, okay. So um, there's all the email that I sent last night that um, I, after helping some students with um, homework four, felt the need to um, scratch out a problem and then uh, give them more time on, on, on the rest. So um, does anyone have any questions about homework four on iterative methods? Yes. Uh, do I need to delete that, that problem that you scratched out since I submitted it before the um, problem was scratched out? Uh, no. <laughs> um, but I will point out that um, the relative behavior of Jacoby and Gauss Seidel that I observed in your assi assignment was not what I expected. <laughs> so okay. that mm -hmm. it might warrant a second look. <laughs> so, um, okay. Um, so, nobody. I know I'm wasting my time putting it, even putting this out there, but. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I guess. Uh, well, uh, of course, there's the hints are up there, and yes, it turned out I had um, talked about a couple of problems uh, here in class, which you are. Uh, free to take advantage of. Okay. Um, now, uh, last time I uh, started a um, with a new chapter on uh, root finding. So the problem with tackling this whole chapter is solving the equation f of x equals zero for some function f of x for which normally it would not be easy to uh, find a root, for instance, by, by factoring, even though we may use that for some examples just because, for examples, we at least we know what we're supposed to get and can evaluate accuracy. But the point is we can use this for whatever f of x we have that uh, um, has a solution. So. Uh, so I discussed last time how we were going to solve this equation is by iteration. We're going to generate a sequence of approximations that hopefully will converge uh, to a solution. And also we had some information about when does this solution known to exist, when is the solution unique, also what makes a problem well-conditioned or ill-conditioned. But um, what we don't know is right now we have no clue whatsoever about how to actually generate a sequence of approximations that is uh, guaranteed to, uh, or has really, really has a decent chance of uh, converting to a solution. So that's what we're going to focus on today is one of several approaches that we'll see for getting such a sequence of approximations. Right. So. How to generate x1, x2, etc. such that the limits as k go to infinity of these iterates. Um, first of all, it has, it has a limit in the first place. We will see cases where it can diverge. Um, but we want to convert to a limit x star and f of x star uh, is uh, equal to zero. Okay, so, um, so there's different approaches that we can use as a starting point to generate such a sequence. Uh, but one that we're going to use today it comes from what we know about um, existence of a solution. So, Um, so if we have, if there's something we know about, some situation in which we know a solution exists, um, maybe we can use that information to at least get a first iterate and we can and then um, try to improve that approximation, uh, try to narrow things down a little bit. Because really what we're doing now is we are literally searching uh, for a solution. So the existence criterion that I gave last time is... 
Um, the intermediate value theorem. Something that everyone sees in calculus one and nobody remembers. So uh, what does the intermediate value theorem say? That um, if a function f is continuous, on a closed interval, uh, a, b, um, c. You, 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 you can <laughs> nope. recite the rest of the theorem if you like. Nope. So, okay. I'm going to mumble it to Okay, well, whatever you got to do. That's right. Okay. <laughs> um, it's continuous on AB. Um, then there exists, and I sometimes resist writing the backwards E and so forth because it seems so unfriendly. Um, there exists a point C in the open interval AB. That's where I was writing a sphere amount of order and now I have to recover. So that's, you know what, actually, yeah. It, it's not a good way to write it. <coughs> I got my clauses out of order. Um, Is what I get for winging it. Um, so for any value y between f of a and f of b, there exists a c, a point c in the open interval a, b. such that f of c is equal to y. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, once upon a time when I uh, taught uh, Cal 1, uh, where this theorem comes up, um, I posed a question to my students that was actually a bonus problem, and that is, why is it so important that f be continuous on the closed interval a, b, as opposed to the open interval uh, right here where I use parentheses? Um, now, to gauge how much people have forgotten, um, what does the closed interval square bracket a, b even mean? That the endpoints are included? Yeah. And then the parentheses is that that's right, not included. So, um, so you have a situation where a function is, so if I were to draw the difference, um, so here you have value f of a, value f of b. So a function is required uh, to be continuous within the whole interval, but also um, at the endpoints. Um, so, so this is continuous on the closed interval AB as opposed to a situation like this this is continuous on the open interval so it is continuous at every point that is strictly between a and b. Um, but the function values f of a and f of b are elsewhere. Um, I, I really think they could be anywhere. Um, so in this case, the intermediate value theorem uh, does not necessarily apply. Uh, so in fact, in fact, if I were to move this literally down there, if I put it up here, um, then this function you cannot find 
uh, but for any y value between f of a and f of b, you can't find a c such that uh, f of c is equal to y, because the values between f of a and f of b are all up here. Uh, so those equations cannot be solved. Um, what I posted to my Cal 1 students was, if I drop this assumption, if, I, if it's only continuous in the open interval, how would this statement of this theorem have to be modified? Um, now, I'm not going to continue talking about that uh, today because that gets a little bit too off track. But it's something that really tests one's understanding of things like continuity, limits, uh, right? limits are used to define continuity, and so forth. All those other things from, uh, from, from Cal 1. All right. Um, now, as far as the, so it's another matter of how we're going to use this theorem to help us solve f of x e equals zero. Well, what this uh, theorem is saying is that this equation, f of c equals y, is guaranteed to have a solution uh, for any such y between these two values. So, if we're going to solve f of x equals zero. We want a situation where 0, our y value, is between these two. In other words, we need a sign change. So so the implication of this is if f of a is positive, and f of b is negative, or vice versa, f of b is positive, f of a is negative, doesn't matter which. Um, so so if this is the case, and if f is continuous, we're only going to deal with continuous functions in this chapter. It's a real pain to try to find zeros of a discontinuous function they even have any. Um, so if this continues in a closed interval AB, then then uh, this equation fx equals zero definitely has a solution uh, x star. I always use x star in this chapter to refer to the solution in the um, Open interval A B. All right. <clears throat> now, um, all we know about this is existence. We don't know anything about um, uniqueness. You could have a situation like um, a function like. Maybe a low, low degree polynomial, for instance. So here we have a situation where f of a is negative, f of b is positive. Um, so we have our uh, one and only root uh, down there. Um, or you could have a situation like this. If I graph a function, that would be something like, uh, let's say, um, some sort of like cosine of a function. So it has some oscillation, not necessarily regular oscillation. Or something like that. So here we have several roots. Um, so, but we're only going to um, use this knowledge of the behavior of f to uh, find one of them. Now, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make up a function. And while I could just take one from a book, um, I'm going to, uh, let's see, actually, I'll need my own last copy of this too.
So I'll make, an I'll make an example and see, show you how we can use this intermediate value theorem to uh, help us find a root. Okay. So, and I guess what I could do after class is, is um, let's see, is um, show you how I construct this example, but. Don't give anything away yet. Um, okay. Anyhow, okay. So So function that that I've made up for this example is now this is one that could try factoring. Something I didn't mean to learn in college algebra, but that's not the point. Okay, that's fifteen x plus four. Um, so if we can find a value of x for which uh, this function is uh, positive. Wait. And one for which it's negative. Okay. Um, then we would know that there's a solution in between. Now, right now we don't know anything about this, but um, given any polynomial whatsoever, um, what, are what are two particularly easy x values to plug in? Uh, yeah, so what is f of 0? OK. Uh, what would be another particularly easy x value to plug in? Yeah, because what, what do you get in that case? What? Yeah, you're summing a coefficients, and you get, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I heard someone say, say negative 2. I remember in, in seventh grade, our math teacher insisted, you don't say minus 2, it's negative 2. Um, like, oh, OK, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what I went with. Then I get to college, and I calculate the professor saying minus this, minus that. It's like, oh, OK, well, that's what I'm going with. <laughs> so when seventh grade math teacher comes shut up. Um, <laughs> so, and uh, actually, that was that's the only time I ever got below a B in math. So, um, well, it was entirely the teacher's fault. <laughs> no, it was Venn diagrams' fault. <laughs> oh. I could not do Venn diagrams to save my life back then. I don't know what was wrong with me, but yeah, I got a D on it or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, fun facts. Um, <laughs> all right. So, so we know. There exists a solution, or a root, in uh, 0, 1. OK. So let's plot our very limited knowledge of a graph. Oh, I, since we're dealing with both positive and negative values, I really should move my x-axis up. Um, well, no, actually, this will be OK. All right, so f of 0 is equal to 4. I'll try to make this to scale as much as possible. Um, and then uh, f of 1 is equal to minus 2. No. OK. So we know somewhere in this ocean of an interval, there's, um, a, uh, there's a root. Um, now, actually, I think it was. Um, I guess it was Cantor who proved that uh, something about like how many real numbers intervals contain and so forth, like the removal of middle thirds and all that. Yeah, yeah. the Cantor set. Yeah. Um, so um, that's why I say there's an ocean of real numbers in here to to search. Um, so here's what we can do uh, to try to narrow down the 
space in which we're searching. We'll pick any value in between 0 and 1. Right, so I'll mark my x values here. So I'll pick uh, x equal to um, 1 half. And we'll evaluate the function there. Now, I'm going to, have, I'm going to cheat and have MATLAB help me out. Um, so I, because I, I have a polynomial here, and I'll just do polyval. Um, and what we get is a negative value. Um, so we have minus five fourths. And actually, what I should do is start making a chart. Um, so I have. x and y. So x is, okay, 0 we have 4, at uh, 1 we have minus 2, at x equals 1 half we have minus 5 fourths. Okay, now, um, using that information in, in addition to the two points we already have, where do we know there's a root? <coughs> 0 to 1 half. Yeah, 0 to 1 half because we have positive and negative, yeah. we now, we still have a sign change. It's a sign change over a smaller interval. And that's the nice thing about um, this approach of choosing a point in between and, and plugging it into f. Now, if you get 0, then you're done. It's no more time. But if you don't, this is going to disagree in sign with one of these, exactly one of these. So you're cutting your search space in half. So at this point, we can forget about x equals no, one. x equal 1 is what I get for winging it. Um, all you teachers to be out there. Um, OK, so now we know there's a solution between 0 and uh, 1 half. So what we can do is now, uh, so we can forget about all this. I'm not going to keep crossing it out. But that'll get messy. But um, So now we can choose a point in between. So one fourth. So if I plug that into my polynomial and I get uh, positive 13 sixteenths. So I'll fill that in here. Okay. Um, so this is the first time we have a value of a, of a function that is less than one in the absolute value. Because ideally, as we keep plugging these points in, the values of f should get smaller and smaller because we're supposed to be getting closer to zero. So now we look at where we have sign change. So we can forget about x equals zero. We know we're looking between one fourth and one half. Um, so now we can go halfway between those. So that would be three eighths. Go ahead and plug that into my function and get. Uh, So I get uh, minus 23 over 64. Um, OK. So um, that would be right around here. OK. So um, we're, we're getting there. Uh, the function times are getting smaller. Our interval is narrowing down. Um, so we can forget about 1 half now. It's between 1 fourth and 3 eighths. So between 0 0.25 and 0.375. Um, actually, I think at this point, I'm going to change this to decimals. I happen to format rad on MATLAB. So. Um, OK. Okay, so, so this was 0.8125, and then the other was minus point three five nine three seven five. Okay, um, so if we do just one more, so halfway between one fourth and three eighths, so that's going to be five sixteenths. Um, okay, so so we have point three one two five, and we plug that in. Okay, 
Okay, so that's 0.191 um, 4065, I think. Okay, now it's beginning to get tedious, and probably someone's saying, what beginning? Um, but uh, so we're down to this point. We have a um, positive value here, so we forget about this one. So we, now we know somewhere in between here and here, so um, 5 sixteenths and 3 eighths. So somewhere in there, um, and I'll plot that latest value, um, there's, um, there's a root. Okay. And we see how this procedure can continue to unfold, that we pick a midpoint, uh, plug it into our function, see which of a endpoints it has a different sign from, and then we go ahead and um, say, okay, well, this is our new interval, you know, tossing out the old endpoint. So we're always replacing one of our endpoints with um, every iteration. And um, so what will happen is um, the search space keeps getting cut in half every time. So at some point, it's going to become so small that um, we would say, well, we're within a root to within you know, X number of decimal places. Um, and then we can stop. So, um, so this is called method of bisection. Okay. Um, because uh, every time through, we're, we're bisecting the interval in which we're searching for a solution. Uh, we keep bisecting, uh, cutting it in half, until we're satisfied with how close we are to a root. Um, well, this example really well, seems rather unsatisfying in a way because it doesn't seem like we're really close to a root. Because look at our function values. They don't look close to zero yet, but they would be. Um, so I actually constructed this example so that um, one-third is a root. Um, so, and you can see from our progress here, we are getting closer and closer to, closer to one-third. Um, it would just take... Uh, quite a few more iterations uh, to get there. Right, so any questions about how this example played out? <clears throat> so now what I could do is write out an algorithm for bisection that would that uh, could be implemented in MATLAB. So here's the algorithm for a bisection method. Okay, so what you were given, you're given a function f, you're given an interval a, b, and you're given that Um, actually, I'm going to put this to you guys. Um, what I said on the previous board was, okay, that we require either f of a is positive, f of b is negative, or vice versa. If b is positive, f of a is negative. Now, that condition phrased that way is uh, rather cumbersome. Um, so what would be a nice, tidy way to describe that f of a and f of b are of different signs? Uh, or just even on paper, doesn't matter. Like, well, what, what be, what be, if two numbers have opposite signs, then what can we say about it? Yeah, if a product is going to be 
negative. So, um, so required that f of a times f of b is negative. Okay. Um, so this ensures that since we're also assuming that f is continuous on the interval, there is a sign change in a b. All right. Now, <coughs> um, so how we would uh, uh, proceed is, okay, well, actually, one more thing I would given. Um, tall error tolerance. So, for instance, we might specify that the tolerance is uh, 10 to the minus 6. So we want to find a, make sure, we have a, find a root with error no more than 10 to the minus 6, or whatever value we choose. Okay. Um, so, all right, so we're just going to start a loop. It's going to run x number of times until we're uh, until we've achieved convergence to within this uh, error tolerance. Um, so, so our actual iterate that we generate x j is. Um, a plus B over 2, so we just go ahead and take the midpoint. Um, and uh, if we happen to get lucky, and we, we substitute this into F, and we actually get a root, you never know, it could happen. Um, I'll just stop right there. Um, so... Uh, our root is equal to um, the value that we've stumbled upon. Um, otherwise, we have actual work to do, but not that much. Um, so what we can do is we can um, check which of these does uh, disagree with in sign. So if we look at f of xj, if it is of opposite signs with uh, f of a, then this is the interval we search in. So A is the endpoint that we keep. B is the one that changes. So B is equal to XJ. Otherwise, we change A. So one of these endpoints is going to become the, the, the midpoint, the new iterate that we got. Uh, the other is going to stay the same. Um, And, um, okay. I just realized I forgot the um, convergence test. Sorry. I need to shift this down. Well, yeah, okay. I need to, I'm going to leave a little. Leave a little Leave a little space in here for the convergence test. Or I guess in your notes you can change your font size and make room, whatever you <laughs> want to do. Um, okay. And the thing is, I just have it if else, one of these things is guaranteed to happen. If it's not already a root, it's going to disagree in sign with either A or B. Exactly one of those two. Um, so, how we check if it's not a root, but if it's close enough to a root? Well, for that, we can say that um, if b minus a over 2 is less than whatever tolerance we have specified, uh, then, again, we stop. So x star is equal to xj. So here are two, two ways of stopping. If f is close enough to 0, um, or exactly 0, or if the search space is so small um, that, uh, that we're, we're that close to a root. Okay. All right. 
And that's it. That's the whole method. That's something you could uh, call up in MATLAB. Like, um, if, you, uh, if, you have a, if you're writing a function um, to do this in MATLAB, then the way you would handle this, like when you get to a point where you know you want the algorithm to stop, um, for this, you could actually use a uh, break or return uh, statement. Um, now, these function, these, these statements uh, serve useful purposes for uh, quitting something prematurely. Um, or when it is the right time to quit, um, but the uh, action is very different. So what break does, it causes immediate exits from whatever loop you're in. That means you can only use it within a loop, a while loop, a for loop. Um, so if there's no enclosing loop, it's going to give you an error. Um, so for instance, if, if I check this condition, and I have a break statement here, then my code will proceed down here to immediately after the loop in case I want to do something else. Um, and now uh, the return statement causes immediate exits of whatever function you're in. So, uh, so, it, it, so it calls your function to, to quit and return to whatever function called it, or up to the prompt, if you call it from a prompt. Um, so you have to make sure, before you use a return statement, that your outputs actually have values. Otherwise, uh, you're going to have uh, some trouble there. OK. okay. Um, so this is, so I often use these statements, break or return statement, usually a break statement. Um, if I have some loop that's iterating on something, um, if I, and I have some check like this for convergence, uh, but I can use this. This is actually helpful also in um, homework four um, for iterative, iterative methods for AX equals B, that uh, you're doing your you know, Jacobi or gauss seidel method, you're checking for convergence, and then you can use a break statement to quit from the loop that's performing the iteration. Okay. okay. Now, um, one thing I want to comment on about this algorithm is this check for convergence, B minus A over 2 being uh, less than the tolerance. Because if this is your current interval, A, B, and you know that a root, X star, is somewhere within this interval, and you've just chosen your midpoint, B, X, J, well, xj is within b minus a over 2 of any point um, in this interval a, b. And we know this interval contains a root. So um, so x star within, that's in this interval has to be within b minus a over 2 of this uh, latest midpoint, xj. So that's why we check whether that distance, b minus a over 2, is less than the chosen tolerance. Because we know that our error is at most that much. Right. And um, now, in the example I just did, it started with an interval of 1. We cut it down to an interval of width uh, 1 16th. Um, so still not all that small. but it's getting cut in half every time. At some point, it's going to be as small as you would like. Right. <clears throat> okay. So, any questions so far about the actual bisection algorithm? Actually, probably the least interesting algorithm we'll see all semester. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, this is as unsophisticated as it gets, honestly. Um, because... Uh, mm -hmm. It's using only very limited information about function values. It's only checking, are they positive or are they negative? Um, if it used more information for that, like how large is it, how negative, how positive, um, it could use that to try to better infer where the root might be. But now we have other methods that will essentially do that. Um, so, um, so 
So this method, on one hand, um, it's, it's slow. It'll converge very slowly to a root. And this is in comparison to other methods that we'll see later. But uh, on the plus side, it will find a solution. That is ironclad guarantee, uh, which cannot necessarily be the set of uh, other methods. OK. Now, um, so there's a couple um, nuances about this algorithm um, that relate to computer arithmetic um, that are uh, worth discussing. Um, now, computer arithmetic was something that was discussed in the first course um, quite extensively. Um, so I'm just going to kind of tiptoe into it and discover only the aspects that are needed. So when you're using bisection with floating point arithmetic, this is how numbers are represented on pretty much all computers. Um, that you have a certain amount of storage set aside for each real number, so generally eight bytes, um, and having that fixed amount of storage for each number, even though numbers can have infinite decimal expansions, um, causes some issues because it means every single arithmetic operation has some error in it. Um, now, um, so first, about how we check for a sign change in one interval or the other, like A to the midpoint or to the midpoint to B. Um, using this test, f of a times uh, fxj, um, believe it or not, it's not a good idea. Um, now, I could put it this way. It's good for humans, not for computers. Because um, when I stated the condition earlier that either f of a is positive, f of b is negative, or vice versa, that's cumbersome. We like to have one thing to check. And like, okay, well, two numbers are opposite signs, the product is negative, we go ahead and use that. And that makes the description of the algorithm a whole lot simpler. Um, but when it's, uh, when it's a computer that's doing the work, um, then the whole picture changes um, because um, if you're if you're carrying this out f of a times f of j now there's certain, of course there's work involved in plugging this into f now we're not going to worry about that you have to plug these points into f no matter what but it's what you do after that um, so this is a floating point multiplication. Um, on the other hand, um, if you look at checking if f of a is positive and f of x, j uh, negative, um, and the thing is, once you check both of these, um, well, actually, uh, knowing the sign of f of a, uh, the, the, uh, you would check that last time around or during a previous iteration. So really, I can erase this one. It's only f of, there's only one um, check. You're, you're checking if, for instance, you're checking if this is. Uh, uh, negative, and presumably you already know the sign of f of a versus f of b. Um, 
All you're doing is you examine one bit in the storage of this floating point number xj, because this is something I covered last semester, that you have a real number stored as a double precision floating point number is filled, occupies 8 bytes or 64 bits. One bit is a sign. You have 11 bits. That is the exponent. And then you have uh, 52 bits. That is the mantissa. Now, for our purposes, we don't care about 63 out of these 64 bits. We only care about one bit, the sign bit. If it's 0, the number is positive. If it's 1, it's negative. Um, well, actually, we should check also if it's 0, which would be the case if all the bits were 0 except maybe the sign bit. You can actually have 0 and minus 0. Um, okay. Oh, um, yeah, go ahead and password me. <laughs> and yes, thankfully, we have been recording all this time. <laughs> but yeah, I have to be more careful about checking that every time after what happened a couple weeks ago. All right. Um, so that checking is one bit to see if it's 0 or 1, to see if the number value is positive or negative, a whole lot cheaper than actually performing a floating point multiplication using a multiplication circuit and all these bits. Um, and in fact, um, multiplication is much more expensive than floating point addition or subtraction. And then division is even worse. That's the worst one of them all. Um, and then other operations that we kind of take for granted, like exponentiation, square roots, mm -hmm. uh, sine, cosine, even worse, because they all involve multiple floating point operations. Um, so, um, so this one is a way to go, where you're just checking for numbers being positive or negative. Um, and uh, so the practical implementation that is what will be done. Now, for personal homework, okay, that's, that's fine, but I just want to point out that, that uh, these aspects uh, matter because your computers are already doing so much work anyway for high resolution simulations and so forth uh, that we, um, anytime we can uh, cut down on computational expense, we really should do that. Um, so, because I think, okay, this is how much of a difference can this make? When you're performing this kind of operation, uh, literally a zillion times, however you want to define a zillion, um, that, that can really add up. Okay. All right, so that's one aspect related to uh, computer arithmetic. Um, the other is, um, all right, so the number of iterations. Um, now, um, the um, so the smallest relative error that you could reasonably hope for um, is uh, so really, it's a relative error that's in any um, arithmetic computation operation is around 2 to the minus 52. And the reason why I put number 52, it's the number of bits in the mantissa. But mantissa holds your significant digits in binary. So what's happening is every time you perform an iteration of bisection, you're cutting your interval in half. Um, then it's like you're gaining one more digit of accuracy in your solution in binary, not decimal. So um, like if you're cutting your interval, you know, half, a fourth, an eighth, so you have to perform four iterations to gain a decimal digit. Um, so, um, so in any, any um, floating point computation, that's the smallest relative error you could hope for. Now, 2 to the minus 52 is roughly 10 to the minus 16. So, um, like if you, it may, you might have noticed this already in some homeworks. Mm -hmm. problems where 
uh, you're checking for two things to be equal, like uh, like for Cholesky, A minus GG transpose, I told you to check that, or A minus LU. And you perform a subtraction, and you find you don't get exactly zero, but you get numbers that are like 10 to the minus 15. So that, in that case, they're essentially zero. So bless you. Um, uh, so there's no point really in trying to get better than this when it comes to error. Um, but that's, that's still pretty dang good. Um, and realistically, in many cases, maybe 10 to the minus 8 is the best you can uh, reasonably get. Um, OK. So the um, so thing is, if this is the best error that you can hope for, and you keep cutting down your interval by a half, then how, what's the maximum number of iterations of bisection that you should ever bother performing? All right, if you, if you, if you keep cutting your, your search interval in half, uh, so your error is being reduced by half, what's the maximum number of iterations that you should even bother doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so how much yeah. capacity for significant digits in your uh, computer's arithmetic system, which is most cases, double, this double precision mm -hmm. that I've diagrammed here, um, that's how many iterations you might as well perform. Anything else, it's not really going to gain you um, all that much. Um, now, uh, certainly if you have an interval of, uh, of width 1, like this example mm -hmm. here where I did interval 0, 1, if you have a large interval, I, you, you can cut the absolute error down with uh, further iterations, but the relative error um, would not get any lower. Um, OK, so, um, so this gives you an idea of how many iterations you need to perform to get very high accuracy. Um, and uh, you know, 50 something, it sounds like a whole lot of iterations. And actually, compared to other root finding methods, it is. We're going to see other methods later where you can achieve this kind of accuracy with only about five iterations. Um, now, those iterations may cost more, um, but uh, it would, definitely those kind of um, methods are preferable generally. They converge so much more rapidly uh, to a solution. So, I've always felt that numerical analysis is, while it's offered by the math department, it's um, really part math, part computer science. And how much of a blend is one or the other really depends on who's teaching it. When I took numerical analysis uh, as an undergrad, it was actually offered by the computer science department. The, my professor was the founder of the computer science department um, at Purdue. Um, so, uh, but I guess uh, most, most of you probably take comfort from the fact that realistically only about 10% or so of your grade is MATLAB based. Okay. All right, so any questions about these implementation points? No, I, I, I do have one question. Yes. Now, because of the uh, Difficulty of the relative error. Yeah. Now, assuming that time was not an issue, yeah. you could one imagine doing bisection by hand and eventually getting more accurate uh, reading on a computer because of the, the accumulation of relative error? Say, let's imagine a human being provided in a, an indeterminate amount of time could do, say, 100 <laughs> iterations, or, or is there another error that would? Up. Yeah, I, I'm um, imagining another okay. kind of machine here. You know. Okay. But, uh, yeah. Um, so, if a per, if a mm -hmm. person uh, was able mm -hmm. to, to chose to uh, flexibly extend mm -hmm. the precision they're working in, um, so because if they start getting uh, well, for instance, the nice numbers I was getting here, mm -hmm. um, you could maintain a finite number of digits and everything would be okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but if it started involving you know, irrational numbers and so forth, then, uh, you know, um, well, good luck. But yeah, <laughs> but yes, um, 
if you're able, if you use variable precision, then yes, mm -hmm. in theory, any amount of accuracy is possible. Um, now, like now in software, there's variable precision arithmetic packages. MATLAB has uh, made a toolbox for that, yes. and it is unbelievably slow. <laughs> uh, and that's why people put up with the error involved in floating point arithmetic. It may be erroneous every single operation, but it's so much faster than any alternative. Um, so, so what we can say when it comes to the convergence of uh, bisection, like I, I talked about convergence in general last time. We talked about order of convergence and the asymptotic error constant, um, etc. So I want to describe a convergence of bisection in those terms because that gives us a basis for comparing to other methods that we'll see later. Uh, and really, this follows directly from the algorithm that, that um, a root x star minus xj um, can be bounded by b minus a over 2 to the k. Um, so that first midpoint, x1, the error in that is bounded by uh, b minus a over 2. Um, and it's something that can be proved by induction, which I will actually assign as a homework problem. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what else to assign. We're not going to have another homework before spring break, because this section has very few problems in it. Um, so I need to pull in some from the next section also. So um, we'll have a homework due sometime during that week after spring break. Um, yes, I know there's a modern test, but you can have plenty of time for this, because I'll cover material before spring break. Um, and then uh, the week after the week after spring break is when we'll do the midterm. So I'll, I'll sort out the date, the precise dates. Uh, well, there's only two possibilities, but um, OK. <laughs> yeah, because you just suffered through a modern test. And, yeah. <laughs> Um, now, um, so what we see here is the, uh, this comes from the error B cut in half uh, with, uh, whoops, that should be K. These letters need to be the same. So, whoops. The J goes to a K? Oh, yeah. So, K in both places. Okay. Um, so, so what you can do is, um, if you're given a certain error tolerance, you can solve for the number of iterations, k, that are needed to get that much accuracy. So what you can do is, I can set this less than or equal to tall. So I can solve this equation for a k um, by taking logs. Okay. Um, okay. Um, now, Um, so what we can say is that the um, so to summarize the pros and cons. So on the con, convergence very slow. Um, so it is linear convergence. So using a definition I gave last time, um, R being the order of convergence. Uh, so the new error is proportional to the old error to the r power. So r is equal to 1. 
Uh, so the slowest kind of convergence you can expect. Um, also, the asymptotic error constant Uh, which I denoted by C last time, is equal to one-half. So when you have linear convergence, um, C is the factor by which the error is being reduced each time. So the error is being multiplied, the error bound anyway, being multiplied by one-half. Um, so it's not an exact relationship because um, you, know, you never know where that root is within the interval. It could be near the middle, it could be near either side, but for the most part, the error is being reduced by half, or at least this bound is. Um, so this is actually unfavorable. I mean, we're always happy when a method converges, but um, it's only because we can do so much better than this, uh, and later on we will. Okay. Um, now, the uh, on the plus side, this method is the most reliable method uh, that we'll see. That um, you know, once you um, are uh, in an interval AB where there's a sign change, you run by section, you know you're going to get to a root. There's no other possible outcome. Um, the other methods, we are not normally able to provide such a guarantee. Uh, we have to be hand wavy about it. Like, oh, if, we're su if our initial guess is sufficiently close to the root, then yes, it will converge. Well, what good does that, that do you? It doesn't really tell you anything. Um, there are certain special cases where you can guarantee convergence of other methods, uh, but nothing like this. So that's why people actually use bisection. I've actually used it from time to time. Um, uh, now, often it's used in combination with other methods. Um, like, for instance, if you try a faster method, it appears to be failing. And you try a couple iterations of bisection to narrow it down a little bit, then try your faster method again. Um, those combinations tend to work very well. So, because um, with mathematical software, it has to be accurate, it has to be efficient, and it must be reliable. People who buy that, that kind of software, um, often at great expense, um, I mean, you guys paid, uh, if, assuming you bought MATLAB and not bootleg it, um, it's. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's, it's 50 bucks. Um, companies, uh, I myself paid 500 for my own copy of MATLAB because I'm not a student. Um, companies pay like 2,000. Um, uh, yeah. so, what? I barely afford it. Yeah. Um, now, actually, now the university is thinking of getting a site license so that everyone at USM would have free access to MATLAB. I was like, could have done that sooner. Are we going to get refunded? <laughs> It's so Probably funny. <laughs> I know. Um, life's so unfair. Um, I'd love to get in front of my 500. But <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, yeah, but the, the other software factors like that are, are, are very expensive, so they need to know if we're going to get an answer. And when you have a method like this by section that under very general circumstances is guaranteed to deliver an answer, even if not very efficiently, um, it's going to play a role. Um, so I, I'm going to show you several methods, but one does not normally use, for professional purposes, just one method. They try to get a best of both worlds thing going. Um, OK, so um, that is bisection, the least interesting topic of root finding. Um, and uh, so I'll start presenting better root finding methods um, on Thursday. Um, so, do you have any questions about the homework? You know, we sort of send them. Otherwise, I'll assume that you're just having a super easy time of it. Well, but that's why I should get questions. <laughs> Call me crazy, but.